Welcome back to the Health Bridge. Dr. Patrick Shojai here with my new friend, Wade Lightheart, who has got an incredible story we're about to get into. I'm going to give you a little bit of background on the gentleman. Uh, he's an advisor to the American Anti-Cancer Institute. He's the director of education at a company called BioOptimizers and the author of a book called Staying Alive in a Toxic World. Uh, professional bodybuilder had an interesting experience, a spiritual experience, if, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, uh, went to the other side, became a, a vegetarian, and then started messing with all kinds of health issues, and then came back with uh, some really interesting resolutions. So, hey, welcome to the show. Hey, great to be here. Yeah, great to have you. I love I love the in-person, because uh, we actually, actually get to like be with people in this on studio, and so I know you all appreciate uh, having people here. So. Uh, how did you go from Mr. Universe to Mr. Marshmallow? <laughs> yeah, well, first, I don't recommend for anyone to do that, but it's kind of like the, uh, the before and after picture only reversed. So you have these beautiful pictures of being on show and you're in shape, and then I totally blew up. And, and it was largely in part because I had a prolonged period of dieting. Uh, I was doing things that was upsetting my intestinal tract. And after the contest, when you know, all the stress and everything finally popped, I just exploded. I, I gained 42 pounds of fat in water in 11 weeks. And I, I, had to, and I began a quest, why did this happen to me? And I turned out, like a lot of people, I had some I, unknown digestive issues that were contributing to this. And I thought it was so crazy because I'm a high performance athlete. How, does, how did I end up sick? Mm. How did I end up messed up? And uh, that led me to the discovery of, of my work today. And so there's always a, a seed of success and crisis. Totally, totally. That was, that was your lesson. So you grew up in Canada. Yes. And you were in rural Canada. So you were there like, you hey, there's nothing to do. I might as well work out. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I was five miles from my nearest neighbor, you know, and uh, living, I, I, I read some Arnold Schwarzenegger books, built a gym in my barn and started training in a snowmobile suit in the winter. Wow. And uh, you know, and then eventually that just led to a career in bodybuilding uh, years later. So bodybuilders love protein. Yep. <laughs> protein, protein, protein. I can't get enough protein. And so then, what happened? Because going vegetarian doesn't necessarily scream um, this is great for protein consumption. What happened there? And then how did you make that pivot to stay in bodybuilding? It's a great question, and I think all athletes today are really focused on protein for muscle and recovery and stuff, but it was kind of a, gra a transition. I went to the, the concepts of vegetarianism after studying uh, you know, Eastern philosophy and looking at that, so I thought that was a great idea, but I was using, uh, I tried soy and casein and whey proteins and all this because I was trying to apply this meat eater's mentality hmm. to that whole thing. I, mean, I, I need to get my protein. Assuming that I'm digesting it all, I just thought if I get 200 grams, I'm eating it. But I found out later that wasn't the case. Mm. We'll get into that. But that's what kind of led me to this, you know, taking in all this protein, trying to reach these goals, and then finding out that that was actually setting me up for a bigger uh, problem that I didn't imagine, even as a vegetarian. So whether it, and it's, the principles are the same for a meat eater or for a vegetarian or for someone who who's on a plant-based diet. Uh, are they absorbing and utilizing that? That's mm. the question. So this is where I think a lot of the raw foodies come in and mm -hmm. make their, I think their strongest argument is that live food comes with live enzymes. Correct, that's true. And I, I, I became a raw foodist for a couple of years to experiment with this and there was only one problem with that. Most raw foodists don't carry a lot of muscle. Right. And, uh, and I've noticed also as they get older, they, send, they have a, a different set of problems that start to come up, metabolic issues and you know, a, a variety of things. And so I was like, well, how do I take the principles of that, which was, as you said, enzymes and real proacts, which are naturally occurring in natural foods that it hasn't been messed with, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and utilize this for a high performance model. And it took me about four years to figure this whole thing out and to kind of tweak and, and get it to a state where we thought was optimal. So you're consuming protein, uh, but you're consuming food, uh, particularly food that's been cooked and is kind of devoid of enzymes. So then the body doesn't have what it takes to break it down. I mean, so we have, we have the bigs, right? We have amylase, protease, um, lipase. lipase, yeah. And so for the big kind of macronutrients, and those are what we need to help break them down. At a certain point, the body's tired, the body's overwhelmed, like what happens? Well, let's start right from the end. 
Enzymes are required from everything from thinking to blinking. Every mm. single chemical reaction requires an enzyme. And they're very expensive, if you will, to make by the body. Oftentimes we have to take protein, convert it into enzymes to use this. So therefore, when I saw a lot of the raw foodies, they, weren't getting, they had very low protein diets and they had very little muscle mass. Mm. Then you have bodybuilders who are eating massive amounts of protein, have a bunch of digestive issues, mm. and they hit, a, they hit a saturation point. So I was like, there's gotta be something over there. The missing link was the enzyme and how you convert. Because if I take in, whether it's 10 grams, 100 grams, 200 grams, 400, whatever amount I'm taking in in food, it doesn't mean it gets into my cells where I need it. It just means it's in my digestive tract. Mm -hmm. And what's gonna convert that is enzymes and probiotics. The enzymes are gonna break it down and then, and then the, like cutting the grass and the probiotics are gonna mulch the grass and make it into small utilizable forms. And if that process is messed up, then I'm not absorbing that. And now I have undigested protein inside my intestinal tract, creating all kinds of problems. Uh, there's actually a piece that I'm gonna jump ahead to just because it's so significant. Because uh, I, I just saw this in the show notes and it made me gag for a second. Uh, undigested proteins create, created something that when John Wayne died of cancer, he had, and I'm quoting here, 40 pounds of feces in his intestinal tract? The, the, I think the scientific term is mucoid plaque. So, uh, and, and if you look at uh, researchers like Dr. Hiromi Shinya, who is the leading gastroenterologist in the world and developed the Shinya technique from Rosalind polyps, he has cameras on his website where he actually goes up and he says, undigested protein, particularly from red meat and dairy products, create sludge-based buildup inside the intestinal wall and this becomes a feeding ground for bad bacteria that can trade on all sorts of disorders and from everything from depression to skin orders to low energy to uncontrollable weight gain, bloating, gas, swelling, all these different things that people are suffering from today. Uh, I know the functional medicine crew is very big on hydrochloric acid and that's okay. something that is you know kind of missing in a lot of us and so mm -hmm. you get all these people taking antacids whether when they should be actually taking acid Correct. to help break down their food especially for the the meats and the red meats and stuff like that so you get all these guys trying to lift weights and eat right. steaks and all that and you were one of those guys i was one of those guys yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so how did you come around to to finding this solution was it through the kind of calamity well, that was all, I mean, there's nothing like a crisis to get you motivated. Um, I had heard ideologies around this, and, but I'd never really got into it because there was not, you know, I was a young strapping guy thinking I can take on the world, and all of a sudden that was all taken away from me. I was like, mm. I'm, I'm, I'm missing something. Mm. And that was how it started, and then went the movement to vegetarianism, and then it went to, okay, well, that's not the answer either there's something in, there's an intermediary between and that's when I, I got into the research and I started looking at, there's a lot of people suffering from these digestive conditions, mm. as you were saying, mm -hmm. you know, hydrochloric acid, acid reflux, I mean, the list goes on and on, irritable mm -hmm. bowel syndrome, you know, all kinds of inflammation. It's like, what is it? And when I looked at how digestion works, what we're eating in the modern world, I realized, oh my goodness, this is what we're all missing. Mm. We don't get enough enzymes, and who knows what's going on with our gut bacteria. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, when we don't get enough enzymes, because we're not eating the raw food, uh, then our body has to basically produce more, so we're putting uh, undue stress on our pancreas, and that's kind of where you're starting to see. So it's like, does this, I mean, I'm assuming like in your teens and your 20s, I mean, I could eat this table in my 20s and I'd be right. fine. Yes. Right? But then all of a sudden something shifts. Is that kind of a metabolic wall with aging? It seems to be. And according to Dr. Howell, who is the pioneer, and he wrote a book called Enzyme Nutrition, which I think everyone, if they read that, will, will get a great idea. He said the average 40-year-old has about 30% of the enzymes you had at birth. Mm. So again, going back to the enzymes that are required from everything from thinking to blinking, mm. people say if they think it's normal to have a D, like a... To, to age and feel less energy or not be able to digest as much or have a bunch of a variety of issues when really it comes down to their body is using up smooth muscle and striated muscle to make enough enzymes to, to, to digest the food in their diet. Mm. So there's a cost and I always use the turkey dinner syndrome. Mm. Everybody's kind of had the big Thanksgiving or Christmas dinner where they're, you know, everybody's eating all the, you know, the, the one and two helpings of food and then everybody makes the mad dive for either the couch or the floor and you're lying there and the drool's coming out of your face and then you wake up and you're hungry again. Mm. And you, you know, you go in for that extra piece of pie. Well, what happens? 
so much food entered into the intestinal tract, you had not enough enzymes to run. So the enzymes that were used for everything else, your body shut all that down, shunted all the blood to the digestive system, starts manufacturing digestive enzymes, and you literally pass out until you can get that managed. Huh. And when you do that, you're craving sugar again because you used smooth muscle in the di in, in, along your intestinal tract to start making complete proteins because digestion didn't happen at the start at where it should in the upper cardiac portion of the stomach. Huh. So uh, even before that, we're talking about chewing, That's which right. is supposed to break down some of the food. Correct. And while we have that up there, we have our saliva, which is supposed to help kind of emulsify and break down and all that before we even swallow. That's right. Who the hell has time for that nowadays, right? Nobody. Nobody does it. Nobody does it. And that's an interesting thing. So people are eating quickly. Um, it's, there's no enzymes in the food present. Mm -hmm. So normally you chew this food up and that starts breaking it down into smaller pieces mm -hmm. and pitalin is released. And, and now the breakdown of carbohydrates starts to happen in the saliva. It goes into the upper cardiac portion of the stomach, which is the top half. Now what most people don't realize is, is hydrochloric acid doesn't come in right away. Mm -hmm. The enzymes present in the food are supposed to start breaking down in the higher temperature of the human body. That's like normal. It's controlled rotting essentially is what mm -hmm. it is. Mm -hmm. So you, everyone knows that higher temperatures, food breaks down quicker. Colder temperatures, it goes down slower. So what happens then, hydrochloric acid starts to come in 30 minutes to an hour after and starts changing the pH level mm. of that mixture. So it's disinfecting, but it's also different enzymes become active at different pH levels at that point, mm. if they're present. If they're not, you just got a disinfected mass of food and then when it gets buffered goes into the intestinal tract then your body's going to start releasing its enzymes out of its pancreas now research has shown that humans have a have a, a pancreas that's four and a half times the size of any other species at the same weight hmm. and that's a very interesting statistic because humans are the only people that eat cooked food Interesting. And, and we have been eating cooked food for hundreds of thousands of yes. years, uh, arguably, and uh, Richard, Richard Wingham, and there's a bunch of like, you know, interesting science going in that direction of saying, look, this is what helped unlock nutrition and helped us feed our brains and, you know, make space shuttles. So there's, you know, it's a, it's a mixed bag, right? So we're better yeah. at consuming food that's been kind of pre-digested, but then we're missing the enzymes. Yeah, and I think, I think there's, you know, what's interesting about that is that those models aren't actually competitive of models. A lot of people think it's a, uh, a or. it's an either or, yeah. but it's actually a both. So there was advantages maybe of having cooked food and survival components and storage components and, and feeding our brains. That, that's a likely truth, although there's no absolutes. But at the same time, there's a corollary effect. It's like if I take a jet, that's great. I can fly from you know LA to New York in four or five hours. Mm -hmm but there's a carbon footprint. Mm -hmm. So there's, there, there's a cost to everything. And it's just about people today recognizing and understanding there's a lot of benefits to all these convenience that we have, but there's also a, a, something that we have to be aware of for our long-term health. And that's what I learned and that's what I go out and teach. You learned it the hard way. <laughs> I learned it the hard way. And yeah. unfortunately, you know, I, I saw a study the other day, Fox News said that 75% of uh, Americans suffer from some form of digestive issue and only half of them report them to their doctor. Yeah. And there you go, they are going to those short-term solutions, the antacids like you talk about and the Pepto-Bismols and all these sort of things that, that mask the problem, mm. but maybe also mask what could happen down the road, yeah. much like I experienced. Or like John Wayne experienced. Exactly. Right? Later on it becomes cancer, but for now it's just, you know, kind of discomfort, so don't wait. Uh, there's a couple, before we leave the kind of bodybuilder thing, I want to I want to speak to this for a second because a lot of people go to whey, a lot of people have this kind of casein-based stuff, a lot of people have soy-based stuff, and this kind of crap protein in a lot of ways, right? Big, huge, uh, oftentimes genetically modified molecules aren't really designed for human consumption and so it's like all these bodybuilders have gas and it's just kind of assumed that that's the deal. That's not normal, right? Like that's not how we're supposed to roll. Exactly and, and that's part of the the culturalization of different sex and, and, and so for example the bodybuilding world was the people that kind of promoted the high protein diet and there are advantages to it as far as building muscle. Sure, it works. Um, but if you look at soy, 
I think there's like 13 different enzyme inhibitors, most of which genetic modified foods. We know that that's a problem over the long term. If you look at casein and whey, I mean, that was originally, whey protein was originally used to fatten pigs. <laughs> you know, and now they've kind of extracted it and they say, well, look at all the amino acids and we have this bioavailability and all these sort of things that sound great. But <laughs> if you go to Dr. Hiromi, Hiromi Shinya, this guy sculpted 370,000 colons in about during his career. And he said, the one thing that we find in the digestive systems of people is dairy products and red meat. And this is what is the feeding ground and the challenge. And you can check out his book, uh, The Enzyme Factor. It's a great book for people understanding that. And of course, that's quite common. After 40, there's a lot of people that, you know, they're going to get polyps removed or even more serious conditions. So you had alluded to something that I think is uh, really relevant for the conversation that's being had right now on a kind of a, a much larger sphere, which is the microbiome. And everyone's like, oh, oh the good bacteria, I gotta do something about the good bacteria. Um, but there's a piece to that that I think is, isn't part of the conversation very much yet, and it's that fermentation, that rotting piece that you mentioned, right? You're, we're, we're warm, right? And, we're and warm. so there's things that happen when food comes in and there's a natural rotting process that's controlled and it's mediated oftentimes by some of these bacteria. So when you talk about this mulching, like the cutting and the mulching, I'd really like to unpack that a little more. Right, so if you look at the, the process, let's go through digestion and how it works. First, we, as you said, you start chewing it up. It goes into the, in, into the upper cardiac portion of the stomach. If there's enzymes present, it starts breaking down. Hydrochloric acid comes in, that mixture starts to change. Your body releases uh, alkaline minerals, bicarbonate buffers is the fancy name, so you don't get, you know, uh, ulcers and stuff. If you have an overproduction, then you start getting ulcers and there's bacteria. At this point, various uh, bacteria strains, good bacteria, will, in, in good means, for lack of a better word, is the guys that help you mulch the grass that you cut with the enzymes or through your right first part of digestion. That's mm -hmm. cutting the grass and the bacteria is mulching it, if you will, to make it mm -hmm. smaller and more absorbable. Well, at each stage, various nutrients will be taking in at, at in that mixture. Mm. But if you have, a, let's say, a mass amount of protein that comes in, or you have a gut biome or the microbiome, then that just serves like of how many species and what do those species look like in your bacteria, which is somewhere in the range from 200 to 500, depending who you talk mm -hmm. to. That's going to determine who gets that. And I always say there's 10% good, 10% bad, and 80% opportunists when it comes mm -hmm. to bacteria. So. At any given time, you're hoping the, the 10 good, but if you have a major change in your dietary habits or you have a pattern of behavior that's not healthy for a long period of time, certain strains are gonna take control of that optimal level, shall we say. Yeah. Stress is a big environment or change. People have all done the trip somewhere and got a digestive issues, right, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's because the environment and what they were taking in changed, maybe the diet changed. Any of these things, stress levels can change, temperature, Everything can change that. Mm -hmm. So then, at that stage, this is where you set up either something going positive or something going negative. And unfortunately, mm -hmm. the trend is it's going negative. Sure, sugar yeah. feeds some of the bad guys. Absolutely, so sugar is a big factor. Rancid fats is another one that's a problem. Undigested proteins, uh, burnt proteins is another one. All of these different things. And then, of course, there's the issue with um, massive amounts of caffeine or genetically modified foods. There was a Princeton study that uh, they, they showed the effects of genetically modified foods and how it radically can wipe out a, a whole host of strains that are essential to your health and function. So is this just glyphosate or are there other elements to this? Because I know glyphosate was designed, uh, you, they basically designed a lot of genetically modified stock to be able to resist glyphosate, which was basically like a napalm bomb that killed everything except what was, you know, what was designed to stay there, but that made it into the food, that made it into our bodies, and our bodies are getting decimated by that. Or is, is, is there more to that? I think there's, I think as, as the science is now turning towards this, because it's such a big issue, I think there's a variety of factors that was previously undetected. I know mm -hmm. for myself, um, you know, when, before the blow up, I, I drank a lot of diet soda. Mm -hmm. I don't drink soda now, but at the time I was using aspartame. And now it's been demonstrated that aspartame has a detrimental effect mm -hmm. on glucose uptake by the bacteria. In other words, after enough of it, they don't even recognize how to digest glucose anymore. 
or mm. you know, to turn, turn uh, carbohydrates into the glucose that we need. And just to be clear, those guys need to be our front line in the gut. Absolutely, not just for digestion, but also for the immune system. So when that's the guys that fights off the foreign, so that there's an always a little battle going on inside mm -hmm. that. And if you have enough good guys, you're gonna win that battle. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and if your diet's okay, it's, you're gonna win that battle. But as soon as you kind of go off that optimal level, then ultimately, you're, at some point, you're gonna run into trouble, and that's evidenced by the statistics. Yeah. Uh, so now everyone's taking probiotics in some way, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, you know, I take acidophilus, I take bifidus. You know, there's the kind of the, the usual suspects mm -hmm. that everyone goes to the store and gets. There's absolutely, it's wild, wild west. Like anyone can make anything and call it a probiotic and people would buy it because they, the tabloid said this is good for you. Correct. Um, where does one make a better discerning decision in probiotics? Because I think that, that there's precious little information about what's good out there. You know, that's a, it's a, it's a great question because now if, if you walk into any of the health food store, you see rows of enzymes and rows of probiotics. Yeah, and what do I buy? Like, which one? And one says 20 million, one says 200 million, one says 10, you know, like, and you're like, well, so-and-so said this was good for them. Hmm. Well, I think there's a couple things that people need to look for. Number one, is it stable? And I'm a big believer, uh, if you can't stabilize it at room temperature in, in, in a capsule, uh, there's a lot of in, in the refrigerated and stuff, the chances of you having the strains that are in it, I think, are very, very low. Be hmm. Just transport being what it is, shelf life, all that stuff. So you want a stabilized uh, bacteria usually in a capsule so then once it hits water like in your side your body and heat it becomes reactivated I think that's the first thing that you want to do I think the next thing that you want to look at is you want something that ensures that it digests protein since that's probably the biggest issue that people have mm -hmm. there's other people that are gonna have other issues on the West that's one of the things you know um, another thing I like now I think and we're gonna see more and more of this is actually patented strains of probiotics in other words probiotics that have been demonstrated to have specialized effects. And I think bacteriology and, and, and this whole study of these pro mm. probiotics is now the whole world's attention's on it. To say, I think you're gonna see like we have super strains of bad bacteria in hospitals, we have mm -hmm. super strains of good bacteria mm -hmm. in hospitals that will perform very specific functions. Hmm. Inside, the inside the body. So I think that's a good thing uh, to look at. I would avoid, uh, when you're looking at it, if it has any of the, uh, the chemicals that you can't pronounce. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> I'll use that terminology. If you can't pronounce it like it's like uh, magnesium stearate or these type of things in it, probably don't want that. If it's a hard capsule, probably don't want that mm -hmm. either. Uh, you'd want a, a soft capsule, and, and uh, you, most, for most people, a plant-based capsule is better hmm. than, say, a gelatin or that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. It's a it's a big problem, and so I mean, there's also like prebiotics and having certain foods and creating an environment to actually make it amenable to such growth, right? So, uh, real quick, I just want I want to kind of touch back on this for a second because it's uh, you're, you're really good at, at painting kind of the, the the picture in a way that people can understand, and I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. um, what so when you're having diet sodas and you're having uh, overly kind of burdened protein consumption that you don't have the enzymes for. This creates this kind of bolus that kind of travels through and the body is trying to hack at and break apart and doesn't quite get there, obviously as witnessed by John Wayne's mm -hmm. you know, intestines. So fiber versus protein versus carbs, like what does that look like in a diet for someone who wants to put on muscle wants to be athletic and wants to kind of be in peak performance, right? It's like, yeah, I could, I could eat like a vegetarian, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to basically not be able to do the things that I want to do, mm -hmm. right? Well, I think there's a couple things. Number one is you need to set up the environment for success, and that is usually you're going to have to take a maybe 30, 60, I recommend 90 days of, of resetting the biome by putting lots of good bacteria in and, and taking your enzymes so you reduce the strain on the body. That's number one to start. Mm -hmm. Number two, you're going to eliminate... Um, any of the genetically modified foods because that's kind of like napalming your bacteria levels and stuff. Mm -hmm. You're going to make sure that you get a lot of fiber, uh, particularly insoluble fiber. Most mm -hmm. of the fiber has been focused on soluble, which is swelling, which can be problems for some people, but the insoluble stuff is something that you'd find like in hemp. Mm -hmm. Hemp protein is a great idea because uh, hemp is very uh, gritty. 
-hmm. in nature. So what that does is that kind of scrapes and scrubs any of that sludge that can build up as it go goes down. The other factor, of course, is hydration. Most people are really dehydrated. So mm -hmm. again, if you have a dehydrated mass down there, it, it gets hard and it gets chunked up. And you can look at Shinya's uh, videos on his website and, and you can see these masses that sludge builds up. Well, when you start rehydrating and using enzymes and probiotics, you start cleaning out that sludge. Mm. This improves your absorption level. So now you can get way more mileage on less of that protein. So for example, as, unlike most athletes, I only eat maybe a half to a third of the protein that my, uh, my peers would eat. Huh. And because it's not about what you eat or consume, it's about what your body can absorb. And bio, bio assimilate. So the biggest myth out there is that people think that if I take in 100 grams of protein, 100 grams goes into my body. No, it's going to be 100 grams minus the efficiency of your particular digestive mm -hmm. system, which is ready to age, diet, genetics, and stress levels. Yeah. And lifestyle, what you brought into it. Yes. Yeah, you could have had a couple decades of being unhealthy and you know that you might be doing everything right now, but you're still your tank isn't as full. Um, That's right. Yeah, which is a challenge. Uh, in functional medicine, we tend to recommend one gram of protein per kilogram of body weight. Mm -hmm. uh, for you and your kind of fitness algorithm and your your extra efficiency, if you will, with your enzymes, uh, is that number about accurate, or do you not worry about that number? It it, it actually is very accurate. Um, there's always going to be a little bit of genetic variance, of course, mm -hmm. for various people, and but you can get into the technical side, methylation or enzyme levels or whatever. Mm -hmm. And everybody kind of has to find the right spot. But I'll give you an example. When I was competing uh, the kind of the classical way, I, I ate what's one gram per pound of body weight. That's pretty much standard in the athletic world that that's what you need to maintain that. And, and there's evidence to support that. But when I switched around and you know had my meltdown and kind of changed that around, what I found is I became more and more efficient. And now that sweet spot is around that, that level for me. So for, for me, I'm, a, I'm just under 200 pounds and I find 75 grams to 100 grams per day of plant. And that's, that's all plant-based, no, no other mm. source for me that I'm taking in and, and I'm more than adequate. What plants work for you? Pea, hemp? Yeah, pea, hemp, pumpkin, I, I think are, are the best. Um, Rice is hit and miss for a lot of people. I find, uh, for the most part, on high levels of rice, it, you get that kind of sticky, bloating feeling. Mm -hmm. uh, there's some people that do really well on it, and I recommend that people kind of try little variant amounts of it. Hemp is probably the best. The problem is making it taste good, and the grittiness is, is, a, is a challenge for a lot of people. Yeah. And so uh, pea will smooth that out, and, and pumpkin makes it another level, of course. And there's other benefits to those mm -hmm. uh, proteins from an amino acid profile. Uh, what about fat? How, how, like, how do you align on fat? I know obviously there's a lot out now saying you know, how good it is to have good fats and, and break that down and get into fat metabolism. Um, I'm assuming you need enough lipase. That's right. Yeah, so again, with the enzymes I, I use, I pro protease, amylase, and lipase as a healthy dose of all of those um, to improve that fat metabolism, which is lipase. Um, I get a lot of fats personally from avocado, coconut, uh, camelina oil. Uh, I take a, a an essential fat, a plant-based essential fatty acid, which has a variety of different uh, oils with different benefits. Things like primrose oil and things like that that I take several times a day uh, to ensure that I'm getting those fat sources. Because being a vegetarian, a plant-based guy, it's, it, it's a little bit more challenging. We don't have the deep sea fish and that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. So, had to play around that, play or play around with that. I have found with the clients that I've used, there's some fats that they'll respond really well to and some that they won't. Mm. So you have to try it. I do try to avoid the, the trans fatty acids, the canola oil, I, I stay that out of diet. You really have to watch it with olive oil because a lot of olive oil has been cut with canola oil. And that's the big thing out there now. So mm. if you have really high pure olive oil compared to what you might find in a regular store, you can tell the difference by its taste, its flavor, and how mm. it feels in the body. Every person's going to respond to oils a little differently and how much. So for example, one of my business partners, he's a very high fat person and I'm relatively on the low fat side of it. Mm. And we just find that's better for our particular metabolisms. Um, but uh, it's, it's one of those things you, I don't think there is an absolute. But on the very low side, 10 to 15% would be low. And I think on the higher side, maybe around 30%. Of course, these are 
are, are healthy fats and plant-based fats. Sure. Uh, just, you have such a fascinating story. I'm just, just kind of digging. What percentage of your vegetable consumption is raw versus, say, steamed or sautéed and stuff like that? Now it is. Well, I did a completely raw food diet for two years, and, and, and that had some benefits and some limitations. So what I find now, it's 80-20 uh, is pretty much the standard. And the 20 really comes from traveling and social, uh, where I'll, I'll, I'll eat uh, cook, cook foods or cook mm -hmm. proteins. And always beforehand, I'm always taking my enzymes before every meal mm -hmm. just to ensure that my I'm not robbing from my body, if you will, to, mm -hmm. to, to digest my food. Mm. So let's talk about that deficit real quickly because a lot of people live in the having robbed the body and being in kind of enzyme bankruptcy and having toxicity overload. Because if that bolus of food hasn't had the right enzymatic activity, now it's sitting there, that sludge is actually creating a, a situation where bad colonies of bacteria are growing. And, and worse things, obviously. You know, you'd start developing all, all kinds of toxicity and all that. So I'd love for you to speak to that toxicity and the implications of what that means for disease and, and disease process. Well, first start, it, it, it starts off as a, a minor system, heartburn, gas, yep. um, you know, uh, incontinence or the inability to go to the bathroom or whatever, that sort of thing. Should be like a meal in, a meal out, sort of mm -hmm. the standard if you're in total operation. So that's what it starts. And then all of a sudden comes acid reflux and then might be skin breakouts or migraine headaches. Mm -hmm. You know, this is the body trying to let you know that you're not breaking down the foods or your diet needs alters. And, and unfortunately in today's fast-paced life, People will just take something to, let's stop the acid, let's get away from the pain, let's take a, uh, something to just move all the stuff out, like a, you know, something for constipation or things like that, and, and think that the problem's over. But meanwhile, there's levels of inflammation. If you are getting protein buildup now, what's happening is the microbiome gets shut off. Some of the bad guys are proliferating. They're producing things like indol and skadol, things that are, they're, they're essentially crapping into your blood. Mm -hmm. And it's these get into your bloodstream and they start, you know, you wake up in the morning with brain fog or depression. You don't know why that is. And, or you may have trouble concentrating. We see this. And, and what people don't realize, it's just that their digestion's off and they're getting, uh, it's like sitting in the garage with the, with the car fumes on inside the body, sort of, mm -hmm. you know, to use an example. Great analogy. Right? And so once you, once you say, hey, well, let's open up the garage doors. Let's put better fuel in the car. Mm -hmm. Right? Let's uh, clean the injectors. And what are they going to clean the injectors? They're going to clean it with some enzymes, right? They're going to have an active or, or get better fuel. And they're going to have a, 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 an octane boost, improving the diet. Mm -hmm. And once you do that, all of a sudden, Hey, you know, I'm, I'm not depressed anymore. Oh, I don't have that acid reflux thing anymore. I'm, I'm going to the bathroom frequently. And so these are the things that we start to notice. And I guess I think for everyone, um, it's, it's really important for you to, to get that professional to, when you get those little minor irritations and recognize that's a sign your body's saying, hey, we need to do something different. Mm. Start tweaking then before it cascades down the road. And uh, once you do that, the, the benefits far outweigh the, the, the time investment or the cost investment. There's something that's happening, it's this phenomenon, and you know, kind of LA is notorious for this, but it's kind of sprung out from everything, which is I feel that car fume, carbon monoxide feeling right now. So what I'm obviously deficient in is detox. So I'm gonna go pipe some coffee up my butt, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do that, I'm gonna clear myself of all my karma for three weeks, then I'm gonna go back to sinning, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's just such an imbalanced way of like tox, detox, retox. And so how about we just don't roll that way? How about if we don't move food through our system in, in a way that, that actually creates an environment for toxicity, it just seems like a much easier way to, to roll than to constantly be like throwing Hail Marys, praying to like, you know, clean ourselves up. Well, you know, that's so true. And, and, and I think there's a, there's a bigger issue going on there. And, and up until this point in time, um, not getting enough food was a big issue. Mm -hmm. uh, for humans up to this point. Whether whatever diet, it was the paleo diet or whatever diet was eating our ancestors were eating, who knows what that was. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and it depend on different parts of the planet. Mm -hmm. The reality is, is food was relatively scarce. Well now it's proliferated, it's readily available, and we're addicted to it. In, in other words, the chemical cascade that is released from taking a lot of these designer foods are designed to hook our brains onto it. Mm -hmm. 
And that is like being addicted to drugs. We're actually addicted. Food has now become a drug because that's how you can sell more of it if I'm a company selling foods. Mm -hmm. So people have to recognize that's the environment that we're living in. And in order to clean up our diet, we're going to need a period of time to clean it up. We've got to stabilize the, 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 the digestive system for long enough that we can fight off the withdrawal symptoms that we're going through because you're going to drive down the street and there's my favorite place oh yeah you know or, mm -hmm. or i'm in that social situation that says oh i gotta reach for that and guess what that bacteria culture is just waiting going bring, uh, it. bring it right and 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 the, and the addiction the brain chemical compounds that we're addicted to so i think more than a, a detox strategy or a particular diet track uh, uh, strategy people have to look at is how do I manage this socially and psychologically? So more importantly, I think there's a psychological uh, strategy that's required by people to understand what's the environment that I'm living in? Mm. What are those feelings so I can recognize it? And then how do I make sure that I, I get what I need and only what I need and still have a little bit of playroom? You know, what's funny is I had a, a patient a few years back, young girl, who had uh, gut dysbiosis and really bad bacterial overgrowth. I mean, she'd kind of blow up like a like she like she looked like she was pregnant type of thing. Um, and at night, she would have dreams about eating ice cream and eating sugar and all of these kind of like cravings, right? And it became this thing where she uh, was like, I don't I don't know what's going on. I said, Look, it's your bugs. There's this really weird, almost creepy psychological component where we have cravings. The, the, the actual bugs are asking us to get them, get them what they want. And it's this whole gut-brain thing we're trying to understand, but it's been documented. There's a lot of people that, that you know, talk about this all the time. You know, it's, you bring up a great point because um, first and foremost, we've kind of lived in a world for the last 40 years where bacteria were just something that were evil and needed to be wiped out. That was basically what we learned from little kids, and it's antibacterial, everything. But what we didn't realize is the symbiotic relationship that bacteria and our digestive system and our brain actually, you know, that they actually work as a synergistic unit. And you're right, you will have these guys literally jacked into your nervous system telling you what to eat, what to do. And it's phenomenal, and there's historical aspects that now scientists are studying that various bacteria will influence, uh, will infect one animal and take over its brain and put them into a position where another animal will eat them. Because that's better for that strain to now get into that particular animal. So now we're starting to realize that there's this, this whole universe going on that's connected, and we're not independent of this. And of course, there's way more bacteria in our body than cells, so there's some argument that maybe the bacteria built us. <laughs> We're just little mushrooms, and they're, this is a little ship that they drive around, and when they're done, they eat the ship, and they move on to the next place. So I don't really know, but I can say that it is a very real thing, and people have to recognize that the first step is, is, is to acknowledge it in an awareness and say, hey, that's not me talking, that's the bugs talking. Mm -hmm. And if you can do that and separate yourself, if you will, and this gets into the urban monk stuff, yeah, right? I was gonna say. You can separate yourself from your body, and let's say your, your processes of your body, or the bacteria from your body, from your brain, now you start to be able to aware on multiple levels. And I think most anyone that's gone through a cleanse, especially if they've gone through a long one or a specific healing diet for you know, 90 days, let's say, where you've got this other sense of awareness, about what's going on inside your body and what's going on inside your environment. But until one's experienced it, it kind of seems hokey pokey or an, or an idea. Well, but that's, that's where it comes in, right? Like, how do you know what's self versus other and what is self? Well, that's for thousands of years, some meditation helped us discover to analyze you know, the voices and be like, oh, I'm not that voice, I'm not that voice either, then who am I, right? And that's kind of, you know, again, that is the, the kind of the, the monk stuff. And you spent some time in ashrams, so yes. we have a lot in common there. It's, it's the good stuff, right? It's, it's the questions that are worth asking. And once you get into that, you realize how much of this noise isn't actually you. And how much of it is just these weird, like, you know, insulin and blood sugar and bacteria calling for stuff. And it's like, holy crap, I'm not even driving this ship. This is scary. Well, you know, I think one of the first things, and I learned early on in my career when uh, I had a high-performance coach, and that was to actually start journaling. 
And nowadays you can just talk into your phone and then if you have a professional, somebody outside of yourself, it's very hard to sometimes at first to self-analyze, mm -hmm. you know, uh, especially if you're being programmed or the, or, or the bad guys are running the totally. system. So by having that outside voice and looking at what's going on, there start to be patterns of behavior. So number one, I noticed with blood sugar patterns of uh, frequent meals or non-frequent meals or high sugar meals or high caffeinated meals and those influences. And then you start to notice that, well, if I eat genetically modified foods, I notice bloating and gassing or if I, I eat soy-based products versus this. So I started to notice these patterns and I think everybody can by just keeping a little journal for a while and watching these and then having someone comment on it, trying one thing, doing that, see what happens and then doing the next thing so that you know what the least, uh, or what the common denominator, or what the common change is. And over the course of six months, 12 months, two years, three years, four years, five years, you start to get a really good idea how, of who's talking inside our heads, if you will. And that becomes uh, extremely motivating and fascinating, and, and I know it's led me on a journey for, for decades now, and it's not stopped yet. When you talk to like a centenarian, 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 uh, I never knew this. My grandpa just turned a hundred. That's amazing. Right? And yeah, I mean, he's just like, he's still a man. Like he's just, you could tell he's still got, he's still got it. And he doesn't like go, oh yeah, that doesn't sit well with me, but I'm going to eat it anyways. Cause that's moronic, right? He has this gnosis. He understands what works for him and his body. So he's like, it's like this biofeedback, like this journaling that you've done. He's done it through a hundred years of life experience. Mm -hmm. And you talk to a hundred year old, they're not like, oh, I'm allergic to dairy, but I eat it. They're like, oh no, I don't touch dairy. Why? Cause that's stupid. That's right. <laughs> My body doesn't like that. Like, why would I do that? Duh. So, um, you are big on enzymes now. I know you've developed enzymes. I know that you've developed a probiotic strain. Uh, I'd love for you to tell us this, and I want to tell our audience that I'm starting a new 100-day gong, uh, and I'm going to take these enzymes, and I'm going to take these probiotics every single day, and I'm going to report back because uh, I've read on this, and I'm totally in. I totally get how I've been enzyme deficient, so I'm going to increase my raw food. I'm going to increase my enzymes. Tell me what I'm, tell me what I'm doing here. Well, basically what you're doing is you're, you're, you're removing the drain, the enzyme cost of digestion, which is the biggest factor in energy expenditure of the body. So when you do that, what that does is that frees up your own systemic and metabolic enzymes to do the things that they're supposed to do, heal your body, give you more energy, improve cognitive function. Mm -hmm. And then the probiotics work synergistically with that so that you can get control of the microbiome so that you actually perfect it. And the particular strain that you're using is, is, a, is a patented strain. And what that does is that actually goes into the blood and starts di digesting undigested protein that might be lying around. It'll get out pathogens. It'll clean out a whole bunch of things. So it's like a, a special forces unit that's going in to clean up anything that's creating uh, problems inside the body. So what can I expect? So I, this, is, this is wonderful and I just gave him a copy of my, my new book because uh, we, we're, we're just kind of meeting in person but I have this metaphor that I always use of the campfire and so it's a very it's Chinese medicine uh, metaphor, right? Where if you have this little tiny fire and you throw a wet log on it, you just smolder it out and it's done. So you gotta just put a little bit of kindling, you gotta build it up, you gotta build it up, and eventually you can throw this table on there and it'll burn. And that's the digestive capacity. Exactly. And you know, I'm 40 years old and you know, taking some punches, and so you know, obviously the digestive capacity gets burdened. So for me, I'm basically increasing my ability to build this fire into this robust place. And shifting that energy so that now my absorption and my assimilation gives me more net energy that I'm putting in to try to break this stuff down. That's just like good math, right? Exactly. So you're, you're, you're increasing your capacity, you're also improving the efficiency of the burn rate of the fuel that you're using and you're providing more heat for everybody at the campfire. So you're getting a bigger fire at less cost and uh, everybody's happy by it. So uh, assuming I follow this protocol to a T, which I always do because I'm good like that, what can I expect? in a hundred days, like what would you start to see? Don't say I'm gonna grow my hair back. <laughs> <laughs> you come back and it's like, like a big yeah, afro. I'll be back like, three <laughs> months later and you're like, yeah, this stuff really worked. <laughs> no, but we're not saying that. Now, the, the first thing that most people start to notice is bloating gas start to eliminate. In extreme conditions, you might notice a, 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 a few days where it'll increase as you start clearing out the system, okay? Mm -hmm. That starts, you know, like, oh my goodness, what's going on? But you're literally moving out some of that plaque. So that could last anywhere from 
a couple of days to a couple of weeks. Once you get past that stage, what people notice is uh, frequency of number two is going to the bathroom. That's one of the big ones. Number two, um, most people start to need less sleep. They wake up in the morning not feeling groggy. There's also an improved awareness. So for example, where you might have eaten foods or done things at one time that you didn't really notice, you'll do one of those foods and something you'll be like, oh man, that stuff made me real feel really bad because again, you start having enough good guys that talk, talk to your brain. Mm. Uh, skin starts to improve. Some people will notice their skin. Uh, eyes will improve. Like they, the people that know they're much more aware and alert. And then mood. Uh, so the longer you do on this, so when you get into that 30 and 60 days level, people start to notice that I'm happier, I'm sleeping less, I feel better, and I don't seem to have the same amount of food cravings I used to have before. Because again, the, you know, the bad guys aren't able to get a hold of your nervous system and tell you those stories that, that, that don't help you. So that's typically the, the process, the, uh, and, and of course the energy levels, uh, sustained levels of energy for long periods of time. I think that's the biggest benefit, and some people are like, wait, I... I I feel like I used to when I was 20. I'm like, well, you've actually turned back your digestion to that level. Great. And so, uh, what if I'm training uh, more aggressively? I'm trying, you know, I'm going into like ninja training or whatever I'm doing. Uh, I, I know I'm taking three enzymes plus a probiotic per meal. Uh, is there any more needed there if I up my protein consumption? Yep. Like, how does that work? Yeah, for, for, for me, so people in hard training modalities, like, so, you know, if you're going into hardcore training, I would go as high as 25 enzymes a day and 10 probiotics. Wow. And the reason being, because I'm probably going to increase my protein intake, I'm going to be training harder. And I will take twice a day, I'm going to take those dosages on an empty stomach. Just let them go in and be proteolytic and do their thing. Before workouts, amazing. So you can do some experiments. You know, do a bunch before workouts. Do a bunch, uh, and and try it with with and without, and see the difference between that. That's a big. Or also, if you get that flat spot in the day, you know, like a lot of people will get that kind of the three o'clock, you know, drowsies. Um, take a handful of those, you know, three, four, five, whatever. Put it in your body, and you'll notice the lights come back on in about five minutes. Huh. It's really, really phenomenal. And I think people start to recognize, hey, wow, this stuff actually works. It's doing something. It, it, it really works. The other thing is, is you can mix up both of them if you're going to do a smoothie. Actually break the capsules open, mix it into the drink, and, and sip it during your workout. And that provides a steady stream of amino acids, so you start recovering in the workout. Uh, you'll have higher levels of energy. You can work out longer, harder, and more frequently, which is what every athlete wants to do. Fantastic. Wait, I really, really enjoyed this. I think that you, A, you come up with this like kind of bubbly, delightful energy, and B, your story is just awesome. Uh, and you know your stuff, so I, I'm really impressed. I, I'm excited to take this challenge and report it back to our audience, and it's gonna be a lot of fun, and I look forward to all those benefits because it sounds great. Hey, real, real pleasure to be here, thanks so much. Yeah, great to have you. You bet. Cheers. So, uh, you're gonna follow me on this. I'm gonna post it regularly on well.org, and uh, again, uh, bio-optimizers, it's, it's one of, the coolest things, I already started messing around. I cheated a little bit. I started taking it. I'm already feeling better, but my official thing doesn't start uh, for a few more days, and I'm just kind of getting everything ready, and I might talk my wife into doing it. So if you want to do it with me, check it out. Uh, well.org slash enzymes. If you're listening and if you're watching, I'll put it in the blog post. I'll put it in the video. I'll see you next week.